Welcome back to Lab TV for this part five, and I'm sure you'll be glad to know the final part of the build project with the Dark Ops Blacksmith building. In this program, we're going to be looking at the roof, something I've been putting off for some time, and we're going to be looking at the final touches that we're going to do just to get the model completed and on the table. We've made a lot of progress. Uh, with a lot of the things we've done but the thing I have been holding back until the last minute is the roof which comes in two parts you can see that there is uh, the main part uh, for the main building and this part here and I was thinking that I was going to potentially do the two bits separately um, uh, but I, I really did think it would be much better if we could do the whole thing together and I wanted to attach these two um, in a manner that was going to create a permanent bond uh, and so what I did is basically took a hot glue gun, <coughs> dabbed it along the edge of the roof <coughs> and then placed both sections of the roof in place. So effectively, if I was in dressmaking, I'd just be tacking it in place so it's lightly held in place. Then what I did, and hopefully you can see this here, is I filled the whole cavity with hot glue. Um, when I say I filled it, I put a load of hot glue in there basically. So that, now we've got a pretty rigid structure because the hot glue attaches itself very nicely to the wood. But when you put that amount in there, which is almost a whole stick of it, um, the whole thing really firms up. And that's going to allow me now to tie all this. Several decisions to make. There's some beautiful detail on this roof, which is a shame to cover up. So what I'm going to try and do is replicate that little bit of damage to the roof when I use the tiles. Now what am I using for tiles? Well wall bases sell some fabulous sheet tiles which are laser cut sheets of relatively heavy duty paper. The good thing is that it allows you to tile a roof and overlap the tiles with, uh, without the, the, the roof bulging up which it would do with a thicker card. You tend to find that you, when you've got that overlap the, the roof you get the first overlap and then it gradually goes up and so almost at the point when you reach the ridge the tiles become uh, horizontal. Um, so I'm just going to do that now. We'll have a look at how that's done. These things are really, really easy to use. All you do is um, you take your section of root tile, pull it out of the, pull it out of the sheet. I'm going to be using scissors to tidy this up and then see how long it is you've got your length of roof and then just snip it to the right right length so let's start that now
you'll see now is that you've got some areas here where the two roofs meet, uh, which ordinarily in real life the roof there would have what's called flashing. Traditionally it was lead, you do get lead substitutes now, but basically this is um, soft metal which is run in there and then gently hammered in with a mallet so it seals up uh, and it becomes waterproof. Now the best way to do that is simply to use a piece of paper uh, to re represent that. I'm just going to take a piece here and I suppose I'm cutting a bit about a third of an inch and what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold that in half right down the middle which will give me the lead flashing and I'm going to measure that to fit because that is then going to open out to fit those two points on the roof and I'm going to just use my scissors to draw a line on there I'm not worried about the bottom end because I can uh, always uh, trim it off as I'm going to do with all these edges here that are overhanging. There's a reason for that, just let it dry, trim it off and you'll have a lovely straight edge. Much straighter than if you faff about with trying to uh, cut everything to fit. So you can see I've got my leg flashing there and I'm going to do exactly the same on the other side. there, taking that down there, and again I'm just going to allow that to cut that so it overhangs, run my PVA up there, and just pop that in place. What I'm also going to do is just put a quick strip across here, because you've got some joins there, so I'm just going to cut an even thinner piece. here which uh, is going to be used to, I've just used a bit of old paper out the bin. Um, I would recommend using a relatively lightweight thin paper rather than a heavier weight card because with a PVA on it you want it just to form its own shape. Exactly the same again for the other side. I'm not measuring this, I'm not drawing lines, I'm just doing it by hand. But it's just a case of using that to cover up any imperfections. And imperfections there are going to be, but let's face it, this is meant to be an old and imperfect roof. So embrace the fact that it is not perfect. And just pop the lead flashing in there. Use, use the brush just to push it all into place. And then we'll trim that off when it's all finished. So we can see we've got the, the building there which has been uh, roofed. Uh, a bit more along the top. Well this is going to have a ridge tile. What I'm not going to do is do that yet. I'm just going to let that dry because at the moment the roof's gone a bit wobbly because I have painted the outside of it with PVA and I'm going to do exactly the same thing again on the secondary roof. This is really simple. You literally just paint it all over the top. I'm just trying to work the PVA in. So that is very much as we've done with a lot of other things that we do. By putting PVA underneath and then on top, you're effectively encapsulating the whole thing in uh, almost plastic. And it, that makes it a lot neater and cleaner to paint. Nothing should be breaking off or coming away. And when that's wet, that might just 
lift a bit, um, look a bit wobbly, but as it dries, it, uh, like everything that gets moist, from PVA moistens the paper, it expands and so the roof can come away, but as it dries, it shrinks back down. There we are, our roof's done. What I've done uh, is just trimmed up around the edges. Just now it's dry, you can just trim that with a pair of scissors, no problem whatsoever. I've put on the coping stone at the top. Uh, that was simply a case of taking the cardboard and just bending it over a straight edge. I used a ruler uh, and then stuck that in place. And we can see that the whole roof is ready and we can place it now on our building and see that we're you know increasingly getting to the point now where this is finished um there's been a lot of work gone into this but i think we're now seeing that we're going to get the results looking at the state of these tiles we've got a choice here we can go red or we can go gray i'm inclined to go gray slate tiles just because i think um it will look better on this grimy industrialised building than something that's bright red and, and standing out. But, yeah. Well, how to paint the roof? Uh, probably the best way to do that is not on film. Paint it black, dry brush it grey, dry brush it more grey and keep dry brushing it grey until you're happy with the colour. You've seen how I paint the walls. I've no intention of boring you rigid with me painting something black and then painting it grey. The important thing is now where we move on to the next phase where we try and make it a bit more interesting. So let's have a look at that. Right, so now we've got our roof painted. The next step is to add some moss. Um, what I'm going to be doing there and using for that is a couple of different shades of flock. One is a dark green, the other is a light green. Before we do that, I'm actually going to put a base moss colour in areas of the roof. Now, moss grows from spores which tend to collect at junction points, so around the uh, ridge tiles uh, and in any gullies is where you tend to see moss starting off. And then it tends to move down the roof in streaks as the spores are taken down. Um, so what I've done is I've used this Army Painter wash, a green tone, to put a very basic uh, thin green wash, which you can see I've moved down. The way I tend to do that is to paint it on and just sm smudge it down with my finger. That has the purpose of getting the... the the wash down the roof but also it rubs it off as it goes to the bottom um, and what we're going to do now is just highlight that up now to highlight green I always tend to use a yellow one of the problems you have with many yellow paints is the lack of um, tone in them they do tend to be a bit wishy-washy so I'm using a Winsor & Newton a fairly thick acrylic paint and this is uh, a yellow deep hue uh, by Windsor & Newton and it's an acrylic so when you put it out on your palette which I'm just using this plate you, you've got a pretty thick lump of yellow which I'm just going to use to streak down just gently catching the highlights so not very much at all just enough to show off the green and if you go over bits where there's no green, it doesn't matter, it's just a bit of... yellowish moss. So I'm just going to do that now, and then we're going to look at adding the moss itself. Okay, so there we have it. Um, now 
I'm just going to get my trusty PVA, put a dollop on there. I'm going to be using this neat. What I'll do now is just take that roof off so we can see the detail. I've got two colour mosses here. I'm just going to put a piece of paper underneath that so when I put the moss on I can collect it back up. And with the darker coloured moss, I'm going to start around the ridge just to show this is the older stuff. And you can see I'm just adding bits of lines coming down there. What we'll do is one face at a time. You don't want the PVA drying out. I'll just put that dark moss paint on there. And then pretty much immediately we can just tip that off. And you can see that we've got the first bit of moss on that roof. And I'm going to go ahead and do that same dark green moss across all the faces of this that building. Okay, so the beauty of using that piece of paper is we can just now take the excess moss that's come off, tip it in there. Now we're going to move on to our lighter colour, which will, it just works basically the same as a base coat and a highlight. Um, but you tend to see that the younger moss will be more at the edges, so that where you've got the darker patches in the middle, you can put the lighter colours further down out towards the sides. And we'll follow exactly the same process with that. See there, you've got a lot more contrast between the two colours. So we'll go through and we'll continue doing that all round, all over the roof. Okay, and there we have it. There's our, our roof with uh, all our moss on it. What I'm going to do now is set that to one side just and clear up this uh, surplus moss that's fallen out. We've got a bit of a mix of it on the paper here as well. A bit of light, bit of dark. What I do is I just tend to collect that up at the end and chuck it in my um, flock mix. It just bulks that out, gives a different texture when you're, when you're doing the basic. But we'll put that to one side, we won't worry about that. Now let's have a look at, more careful look at this piece of paper because on the other side 
you'll see that what I've done is I've printed out some French posters. One of the nice things about making an area looking lived in is the ability to add a few bits and pieces. And one of the things I really like about French buildings is the quality of the French advertising posters, which are always um, uh, very flamboyant and colourful. Uh, the same with the big um, uh, painted advertisements you get on the ends of buildings. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to use our scissors to cut them out and add them to the building. Um, there's other options we can think about doing things like adding in graffiti, but the only problem with that is it does tend to link our buildings too much to one particular period. I've got some very nice French buildings which have got some German road signs painted on which means I can't really use them for 1940, which is a shame. So what we do is we find a wall on which to pop them and we'll put our posters on the building there. Move them about a bit. Just going on there, giving it a bit of colour. We've got plenty of room around here as well. Adding these on really is just a case of getting the building to come to life. One of the tricks is when these dry, you can actually put a little bit of sandpaper over them and distress them so that they look like they've been on there for years. Okay, so there we have it. On to the next stage now. Our building's pretty much done at this point in time. Just a case of adding a few bits and pieces in um, to make it look a bit more uh, lived in. So let's have a look at what we've done for that. Okay, what I've done is just taken a couple of round bases, uh, slightly different diameters, in order to populate our base. Now let's have a look at the way I've done this. You can see on this one that I've, what I've done is I've just taken some MDF offcuts um, from a load of building models. They tend to have little tabs that you can push through and keep there, and I've kept them sort them out into similar size and these I've just piled up as piles of bricks and I've, out of green stuff I built a couple of sacks and then from the Perry 8th Army uh, box set plastics I've got a pick and a, and a shovel or a spade whatever it is it's a spade actually, the shovel's got slightly different sides um, and then I've just based that up as normal so that can actually go in the yard then, uh, here's this one, a um, bit more exciting. I've actually got a, a matte varnish these, but piles of wood, uh, the typical of the type of thing you'd find in a builder's yard. What I've done is, if you remember where I built up the sides of the uh, sand and gravel areas, I used some wood that I found. Well, I just cut that wood into similar uh, lengths, stuck it on the base, used some green stuff to build a tarpaulin, I looked up online French road signs of the 1930s and um, they're relatively similar to the ones of today. That They have a yellow background and here's a couple of ones which show men at work. Um, I wasn't sure about the colour of the poles for France in that period. In the UK at the same time uh, the poles were black and white hoops. So I just went with that because they stand out better. And to be honest with you, when you look how similar the road signs are to the UK ones, you have to assume that they're going to be relatively similar. So that just needs, uh, this was done out of green stuff, which I've just painted up as a tarpaulin, um, and again based that as normal. So those can just go in the yard. I'm thinking about getting some boxes and bits and pieces, but these, these could really be kind of anywhere uh, in that yard just to make it look a bit more lived in. And that, I think, 
is our building complete. Well, thanks very much for watching this build project on Lard TV. We hope you've enjoyed it. It's taken slightly longer than we thought, but I thought it was important to let you see how we did it at each stage. Um, and uh, hopefully see how we've taken a, a nice building and, and really turned it into something quite unique, which I think we all like to have something on our tables that nobody else has got. And one of the negative things about MDF buildings, and let's face it, there's lots of positives about them, but one of the negatives is everybody else has got the same thing. And just by doing something different, it brings that building into a different league. Even if you're taking your standard MDF building and putting those roof tiles on and adding a bit of moss to the roof, even if you're just putting that little bit of plaster on and giving that a bit of wash of colour um, or trying other effects such as that brickwork or uh, adding, a, adding a yard just to make things um, a little bit different. So, if you've got any questions, please put them below. We do always try and answer questions we have about our build projects. Don't forget to subscribe. Completely free to do so. We're not going to uh, link this to any kind of pay uh, wall. We're not going to be uh, running adverts on here. We're keeping this all completely free to view. So by subscribing, all you're doing is keeping yourself up to date with what's happening on Lard TV. And we've got a lot more coming up in um, uh, over the next few weeks. We've got the next battle in the Jean Blue Gap campaign, and we're hoping to have some more General Darme. And Sydney and I are looking at getting cracking on with some Dutch Britannia RM videos which uh, have been much asked for. So, there we are. Thanks again for watching and we hope to see you on Lard TV soon.